Turn to Job chapter 28. Job 28. If you're visiting with us, if you go to the Black Bible, and the chair in front of you and the chair next to you, you'll find Job 28 on page 383. Start the beginning of the Bible there, the table of contents. And then go forward, go to page 383. Find Job chapter 28. And please, please excuse me for my allergies. Just those are acting up. Thank you for your mercy in that. And as you're turning <clears throat> to Job 28, next week we'll take a break from Job. I'll do a message on uh, pertaining to the resurrection of Christ. Uh, we're going to look at Romans 8:34, I believe it is. Of the resurrection, and we'll look at the surrounding context as well, um, centering there on that verse of chapter 8 about the resurrection of Christ, and we'll drop back into Job the following week. Job 28, let me read. Surely there's a mine for silver, and a place where they refine gold. Iron is taken from the dust, and from rock, copper is smelted. Man puts an end to darkness, and to the farthest limit, he searches out the rock and gloom and deep shadow. He sinks a shaft far from habitation, forgotten by the foot. They hang and swing to and fro far from men. The earth from which comes food, but underneath it is turned up as fire. Its rocks are the source of sapphires, and its dust contains gold. The path no bird of prey knows, nor has a falcon's eye caught sight of it. The proud beasts have not trodden it, nor has the lion passed over it. He puts his hand on the flint, and he overturns the mountains at the base. He hews out channels through the rocks, and his eye sees anything precious. He dams up the streams from flowing, and what is hidden he brings out to the light. Verse 12. But where can wisdom be found? Where is the place of understanding? Man does not know its value, nor is it found in the land of the living. The deep says it is not with me, and the sea says it is not with me. Pure gold cannot be given in exchange for it, nor can silver be weighed as its price. It cannot be valued in the gold of Ophir, and precious onyx or sapphire. Gold or glass cannot equal it, nor can it be exchanged for articles of fine gold. Coral and crystal are not to be mentioned, and the acquisition of wisdom is above pearls. The topaz of Ethiopia cannot equal it, nor can it be valued in pure gold. Where then does wisdom come from? And where is a place of understanding? Thus it is hidden from the eyes of all living, and concealed from the birds of the sky, abandoned and death safe. With our ears we have heard a report of it. God understands its way, and he knows its place. For he looks to the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. When he imparted weight to the wind and meted out the waters by measure, when he set a limit for the rain and a course for the thunderbolt, then he saw it, and declared it, he established it, and also searched it out. And to man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. An angel appeared at a faculty meeting and told the dean that in return for his unselfish and exemplary behavior, the Lord would reward him with his choice of infinite wisdom, wealth, or beauty. Without hesitating, the dean selects infinite wisdom. Done, says the angel, and disappears in a cloud of smoke and a bolt of lightning. Now all the heads they turn toward the dean, who sits surrounded by a faint halo of light. At length, one of his colleagues whispers. He says, say something. The dean looks at them and says, I should have taken the money. <laughs> Last week, we looked at having a biblical worldview Chapters 25, 26, and 27, as Job is calling us to trust in our sovereign God and trust him with a biblical worldview, biblical thinking, and biblical living. And it's not by accident that this falls, chapter 28, falls on the heels of that. 
Because he's calling us, Job, to trust our sovereign God in this painful, unknown suffering. Unknown in the sense that it's coming to you and you don't know the source. It's not consequences from sin, a poor decision, a bad judgment, blah, blah, blah. Those things, it's not from that. You don't know why, but you're suffering. Trust our sovereign God and you trust him with God-given wisdom. Wisdom which is above riches. Wisdom that you can't buy. Wisdom that you can't find here on the earth, though you can search for it. No, we trust him with wisdom that's God-given. God gives you this wisdom. Well, the first question we have to ask is, well, what is wisdom? And Job's going to narrow down specifically what is wisdom there in verse 28. Let's kind of go from here. Let's go kind of outside and see what is wisdom in general and give a definition to that. Wisdom is the proper application of knowledge. Skillful living. Or the skill of living a spiritual life. Or living life the way God intended it to be lived. The way he put life together. Simply put, it's putting knowledge into practice. And, and then you'll, you can see why or how verse 28 will come into play in this because if you are living life the way God intended, God intended for you to live life by fearing his name and by shunning evil. Obviously, this is going to be tied to his word, the scriptures. Dr. Stephen Lawson says this about wisdom. It's spiritual insight from God that provides discernment or insight into a life situation. Seeing it for what it is, and the proper application of biblical truth to that situation. So wisdom is unattainable by us. We don't have it. We don't know where to find it, necessarily. We can't search for it here up on the earth. Digging and searching. It's known only to God. It only comes from God. I mean, we, we will go to great lengths to find valuable gems and rubies and diamonds and all these things, but we're lazy when it comes to actually seeking wisdom in God's word. Really, wisdom is not about what we know, but who we know and how we live. And you don't need to know why God does this or that in your life or why he brings this or that into your life. You don't need to know those things. We do need to keep honoring and trusting him in his sovereignty, though. But yet, that's what we think. When it comes to life situations, we want to know why. Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? Why is this happening to me? Why is that happening to me? We want to know the answers to the difficult questions of life. And quite honestly, God hides all the answers. The secret things belong to the Lord. Deuteronomy 29, 20. Not meant for us to know. No, all you need to do is ask God for wisdom to endure it. James 1 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. One writer says wisdom is not about knowing why, wisdom is about knowing God. Job didn't need to ask why. He just needed to trust and live for God as always. And yet that's it's going to be why God is going to be speaking to him. And a few chapters later, God's going to come after Job and say, you don't need to know why. Have you done this? 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 And Job's going to, yeah, no. So you don't need to know why. And what is the apex of God's wisdom? What is the apex? Where do you find it? It's centered and our time at the cross. The cross, which is foolishness to most people. But that's where we begin a life of wisdom. Months ago, we looked at this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul said, for indeed, 
in chapter 1, verse 22 of 1 Corinthians. For indeed, Jews ask for signs, but in Greeks, they search for wisdom. We preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are the call, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. What's the apex of God's wisdom is, is found at the cross. What? What? This God man died and rose? That's stupid. That's crazy. No, that's life. Amen. See, wisdom, wisdom is rooted in a relationship with God, which only comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. And see, this is intelligent thinking, not simple thinking. The ways of the world are simple and naive thinking. I mean, they think you're nuts. You don't go to pop psychology to deal with your problems. You go to the Bible. Well, that's stupid. That's what I think. You go to, to success stories of businesses and companies. To Yes, that's where you go to try to figure out how to grow a church. Not to the Bible. You don't go to the Bible for it to grow a church. That's stupid. That's what they think. Ah, too many churches are bought into the world, too. You know, Proverbs 9 10 is very clear. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Right? This is just to introduce us to this chapter here. And then we're gonna, we're gonna, let's dive into the different sections. Before we do that, just kind of a little side note, a little footnote to you. For your information, I take the view that Job spoke these words. There's actually some scholars that don't think he did say this. I think it's pretty clear. If chapter 27 starts, 27 1 says, then Job continued his discourse and said, and then chapter 29 verse 1 says, and Job again took up his discourse and said, I think it's pretty safe to say that in between Job said those things. <laughs> Does it take a rocket scientist to figure that out? You don't need your master's degree to figure that out. <laughs> so anyways, can you sense my sarcasm with some of these guys that I read? I read these guys and say, what? what? They think Zophar said this. It's kind of pulling that out of the air. Never mind, just don't go under that. It's just so annoying, <laughs> sorry. <clears throat> anyways, I think it's very clear Job said these words. So, this type of wisdom, this wisdom can't be sought in this world. That's what I mean by that. Digging around, searching through different things, and digging and, and mining and, and smelting and refining. You can't find it in this world, this wisdom. This wisdom can't be sought. That's verses 1 through 11. 1 through 3 begins. There's a mine for silver. But he refined gold. Iron is taken from dust. From rock, copper, smelt. And puts an end to darkness. He searches from the farthest part. The rock in gloom and deep, deep darkness. He goes to the inner depths. Mining, excavating, smelting, refining. Heating up the rock. And separating out the rock from, from these precious metals. And, and, and there's four mine metals that are the focus. He's looking at silver, gold, iron, and copper, not to mention the different jewels that he brings up. So he would penetrate to the farthest reaches of the earth and search these precious metals. So the comparison is, is that. They're, they're searching and going after these precious metals, and yet two comparisons. One is you can search and search, but you won't find wisdom, first part. Second, people don't search and search and search for wisdom like they do for precious metals. It's both of them. They go where none have gone before. We have such technical skill to mine for these things, even today. I mean, doesn't it blow your mind that they can actually drill for oil in the middle of the ocean? That's pretty amazing they can do that. That's how far we can, we can go out in the middle of the ocean and drill down and extract oil. 
of fracking too. Where they take the sand, they actually get oil from sand. It's amazing. So we'll search and search and search and search after these resources. And why don't we search and search and search and search after God's wisdom? Notice verse 4. Sinks the shaft far from habitation, forgotten by the foot. Hang and swing to and fro from men. The earth from it comes food. But underneath it, though, is turned up by fire to rocks, or the source of sapphires. This dust contains gold. So the idea that they're dangling from a basket. These huge shafts that go down. We don't think they did that in ancient times. Well, yes, they did. They, they were mining from these things in ancient times. And they would be hanging by a rope in a vertical shaft. Going after these and pursuing these precious gems in the dark places of the earth, but they knew exactly where to find them. And that's why he says there in verse 5 food comes from the earth, but underneath it, it's turned into fire. What does that mean? That's what they would do. They would build these large, a large fire on a platform, and they would heat up the wall of the tunnel. And then they would, they would, the tunnel would become so hot, the rock would become really hot, they would take water and then pour the water on the rock. And it would crack the rock, and then the rocks it would fall down, and then it would rake up the fallen rocks, and it would find all these precious gems, like gold. And you have there in verse 6, sapphire, maybe a, a better translation might be lapis lazuli. Lapis lazuli, still found today, it's a deep, dark blue stone, not necessarily an expensive stone. Um, the low grades, they may sell for less than a dollar per carat, but the super fine material of the lapis lazuli, it can reach up to 100 to 150 dollars per carat. And not, not even mention what they sell at retail. And that's today. So this, you get some pretty good bling bling from this stuff, you know what I mean? I mean, that's today, can you imagine it back then? Seven and eight. The path no bird of prey knows, nor has the falcon's eye caught sight of it. The proud beast have not trodden it, nor has the lion passed over it. What's he talking about here? It's so secret, it's so secluded are these deep minds that, that the falcon's eye can't see it. And the falcons, I mean, they can see things miles away, can't see it. And then the strongest beast, like a lion, he can't even set foot in there. So notice, talking about the one that dominates the sky, the one that dominates the land, kind of representing all the animals. They can't even find this stuff, what man is doing. Oh, boy, he does such a great job looking for all these gems. Verse 9. He puts his hand on the flint, overturns the mountains and the base. He was out channels, the rocks, his eyes, sees anything precious. Dams up the streams from flowing, what is hidden, he brings out the light. So he's overturning the mountains to get to the treasures. They're carving channels, tunnels to, to grab anything precious. They'll even dam up the streams from flowing or trickling down. They'll dam up the streams to bring these valuable items will dig deep down in there because that's where in those streams where the water flowing down, all the sediments, right? They'll dam those things up, looking for those valuable things. Valuable, precious gold. They had, they had gold in Alaska, didn't they, Tim? They did some gold, yeah. So we work hard to do this. But you still can't unearth any wisdom. You'll search and search and search and search and search, but you can't unearth wisdom. We do whatever it takes to find valuable items only. We work hard to make good money. Whatever we can to keep things going financially. I mean, we plan our retirements for financial crisis, plan for a vacation, we plan for this and that, emergency. We spend money to get what we want. And yet, when it comes to wisdom, fearing the Lord, well, we don't want to work hard to discipline ourselves. We want to hand it to us. So remember, he's doing two parts here. One part is, is these guys will search and search and search and search and search, but you won't find the wisdom. And the other is they'll search and search and search for these gems, but they won't search and search and search for God's wisdom. Why don't they seek after it? Like they seek after gold. Why don't we do that? Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 4 that we should, we should uh, discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness. Work at it. But you can't seek wisdom on your own. Realize that when it comes from sovereign God, when we seek Him, it's a given to us. So how hard, how hard do you work at seeking the Lord? 
hard you work at trusting in God. We give up too easily. We bail. We, we hit a little snag. We just quit. This wisdom it can't be sought. Search and search and search, you won't find it. You know, if we search and search and search for these things, why don't we search after God and His wisdom instead of the things that will pass away in this world? This wisdom cannot be sought. Second, this wisdom cannot be bought. You can't buy this. You have all the money in the world that you want, but you can't buy the wisdom. Notice, look at verse 12. Here's the theme. But where can wisdom be found? Where is the place of understanding? Man doesn't know its value. Where is it found in the land of the living? The deep says, it's not in me. The sea says, it's not with me. Where is it? There's no place in the world where humans are able to find it. You can't seek it and you can't buy it. And given what we can excavate, you can't excavate it. Man does not know its great value as well as being ignorant of where to find it. It's not in the land of the living, or the oceans, or the sea. No habit, it's not in us. If man could probe even to the deepest parts of these places, like there, where he says in verse 14, the deeps and the seas, wisdom still could not be found there. He still has no understanding of the value of wisdom. Notice how he compares it, verse 15. Pure gold cannot be given. Silver can't be weighed. It cannot be valued in the gold of Ophir. And precious onyx or sapphire, gold and glass cannot equal it. It can't be exchanged for articles of fine gold, coal and crystal, not to be mentioned. Access of wisdom is above pearls. The topaz of Ethia can't equal it. It can't be valued in pure gold. Wisdom has treasures rarer than any other treasure. It's absolutely priceless. Notice the four different terms of gold that he uses in 15 through 19. There's actually four different Hebrew terms. There's pure gold, the gold of Ophir, gold, and then fine gold. All four different terms in the Hebrew. Not to mention the eight kinds of precious jewels. God's wisdom is invaluable. It's costly and accessible to us. As humans, it outweighs the jewels. There is simply no amount that can purchase it. You cannot collect enough wealth to purchase wisdom. So we actively pursue jewels and treasures and wealth and health. I mean, who would seek after those things? We rarely pursue or seek after God's wisdom. And on top of that, its value surpasses precious onyx. Lapis, lazuli, coral, jasper, gold, silver. And you can't seek it. You can't buy the wisdom by the world standards of good. You just can't do it. Interesting how he takes 20 and 21, 22. It's almost identical to verses 12, 13, and 14. 20 says, where then does wisdom come from? Where is the place of understanding? It's hidden from the eyes of all living. And concealed from the birds of the sky, abandoned, and death say, well, with our ears, we, we've only heard it. So 12 through 14 talks about our inability to find it. 20 through 22 is our inability to acquire it. Humans won't find it. Birds can't see it. Destruction and death, that's abandoned. And death. They don't know where it is. It's just hearsay. I don't even heard of it. It's just like precious metals, but it's even more valuable. So you can seek after it. You can do all the seeking, but you won't seek after it. You can try and get as many things as you can, precious metals, but you can't buy it. What is it? This wisdom is God given. It must be given to you. It's a gift. God alone knows where to find wisdom because he is wisdom. 
That's where 23 and 24 changes it. God understands its wisdom, its way. He knows its place. He knows wisdom. He understands it because he is wisdom. He looks to the ends of the earth. He sees everything under the heavens. God sees everything without searching. God doesn't need to search. So he is wisdom's master. He sees it and knows it. He is wisdom as a gift to humans who ask for it. Notice what he brings up in 25 and 26. When he imparted weight to the wind, weeded out the waters by measure, he set a limit for the rain, of course, with thunderbolts. Notice what he's bringing up wind, rain, or, excuse me, wind, water, rain, and thunderstorm. Four different mysteries. The wind. Did you glimpse of the wind yesterday? So if I, Seth got out of the van and we got home, and the wind kind of picked him up and went this way, whoa, hey, you know, he weighs nothing. And I just, there you go, there goes like Seth. You don't see wind. You just see the effects of the wind. You don't see wind. The water, the power of the waves of the seas. Oh, it's just fine and dandy. And fine to stand out here and go out there and go out in the water. But boy, you get under a wave, and what happens? What takes you? Don't even struggle. Just let it, let yourself go, because eventually you'll pop up. Because man, the power of the sea will overtake you. I've had that happen too many times. My kids, they don't care. I do. I don't want to drown. So anyways. <laughs> Dad, come on the ocean. Go ahead. No, thank you. Unless it's freezing cold. Oh my goodness. Rain. The rain falls. Along with that, the thunderstorms. Oh, I love monsoon season. The thunderstorms. The beauty of that. These are mysteries. This is God. It's all done in wisdom. God alone possesses. This is power. This is his wisdom. The wind blows. The seas are measures. The rain falls. The tea storms. So... When we look at the greatness of these things, we, we can see God created all these things in true wisdom. Everything. Those are just but examples. Because notice he says in verse 27, then he saw it and he claimed it. He established it and also searched it out. What's, what's he talked about? Wisdom was set as his counselor, and, and God used wisdom to form, to create the universe. Proverbs 3 brings us up, 3 and also 8. <coughs> Proverbs chapter 3, verse 19. It says, The Lord by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. And by his knowledge, the deeps were broken up, and the skies dripped with dew. He was established, he founded the earth. It's all it's part of what Job was saying here in chapter 28. In Proverbs chapter 8, verse 22, Solomon says this, The Lord possessed me, wisdom, at the beginning of his way, before his works of old. From everlasting I was established, from the beginning, from the earliest times of the earth, when there were no depths I was brought forth, there were no springs abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills I was brought forth, well, he had not yet made the earth and the fields, nor the first dust of the world. When he established the heavens, I was there. He inscribed the circle on the face of the deep. When he made firm the skies above. When the springs of the deep became fixed, when he set for the sea its boundary, so that the water should not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundation of the earth, then I was beside him, a master worker. Now his daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the world, his earth, and my delight in the sons of men. That's what he's saying. This is wisdom. And God is wisdom. He had wisdom. He formed the earth in wisdom. So he's the only source of true wisdom because of who he is. And man should be able to see the creation and come to the conclusion that all of this was made in wisdom, not evolution. It's made in wisdom, which stems from God, this wisdom. 
and yet humans are evil. Paul says in Romans chapter 1, For the wrath of God is being revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. The truth about what? About who God is. The creation, the way he's made, his invisible attributes, it's clearly seen through what has been made. They're without excuse, but they suppress it, and Paul says they exchanged it for a lie. Unfortunately, humans respond this way all the time to God. All the time. To God and the angels. Man will not seek after God. Because we want things done our way. Not God's way. But God steps in and changes will. God steps in and changes us so that we will see who he is and we'll see his glory. See, God is holy and we are not. We're sinners. We're rebellious. But God, man, took on flesh. The eternal son of God took on flesh, was perfect, died, and rose for all those who turn from their sin and trust in Jesus. And God changes our will so that we will embrace God. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, that's a message for you. You turn from your sin and trust in Jesus. That's where wisdom will be found. So Job walks through all this. You, you can try and seek it, but you won't. You can try and buy it, but you can't. God is wisdom. And then notice the, the climax of chapter 28 here in verse 28. And to men he said, Behold, See this, notice, behold, get your attention. The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. God sees wisdom, he has wisdom, he uses wisdom, he controls wisdom, so he reveals wisdom. So, what is wisdom? In the text, it's fearing God and turning from evil. That's wisdom. So you want to apply this text to you? Simple. You must fear the Lord and shun evil. You must look to God for wisdom. Fear Him, give Him glory, and live according to His ways. That's where true wisdom is found. To shun evil is wisdom. And do you want to increase it? you want to increase your wisdom? Then keep obeying God. Keep obeying His word. Obey His word in school. In a workplace, with friends and neighbors, anywhere that you are at, this is what true wisdom, this is where true wisdom is found. The psalmist says this in Psalm 19, verse 7. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Are you simple this morning? Are you naive? Are you a fool? Fear God and shun evil. That's wisdom. And notice, it is not, wisdom is not thinking God's thoughts after him. Wisdom is not trying to understand why God does this or that or the other. No. It's found in you just being human. Admit you're worthless and you need God's grace. That's wisdom. That's wisdom. That you need God. He don't need you. What do we mean by fear? Fear, stand in awe, reverence, honor. You take God seriously. God is our creator, and we are accountable to him alone. That's taking God seriously, right? You have this attitude. Attitude leads to submission. You humble yourself before him. James, James chapter 1 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Later on, the same book, he says in chapter 4, submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil, he will flee. 
Turn to God. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Wash your hearts, you double-minded. That's what he's telling them. Turn to God. Submit to God. Shun evil. That is wisdom. Fearing God. That is wisdom. And if you want to keep increasing in wisdom, you must keep obeying God and his word. That's where it's found. So you bow and yield in loving trust to obeying God and his ways no matter what you face in life. In good times and bad times. When you're feeling like it and when you don't feel like it. Oh, see, that's where I'm at. Yeah, see? See, when you're feeling good, right? Oh, yeah. Lunchtime. Mm -hmm. Have a barbecue. I'm feeling good now. Get my chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> Taste chocolate. I'm just on your case today. Like, yeah. What well, if you can't get chocolate at the store? They're all out, Susanna. <laughs> So what if things are going wrong? What if things are bad when you're not feeling good? No chocolate. When that person is being a jerk. If you're struggling, you're in pain. Then you're in pain the next day, the next day, the next day, and it doesn't go away. When you have to lay in a bed in a hospital for Month. four or five weeks, like Donna. And she's in excruciating pain and she has to push a button every time she's in pain because that's when they, she gets her pain medicine. You see what I mean? It's easy to fear God. It's easy for us to fear God when things are going well. But see, we're called to fear God no matter what we face. Obey him no matter what you face. And when you do, you receive life and blessing. God will take delight in you. And for you to have this insight that only comes from God by means of his word, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Again, I told you earlier, there's only one way. It's rooted in a relation with God through Christ. That's the only way. And this is intelligent thinking. And the ways of the world are simple and naive thinking. This is true wisdom and intelligence. And see, it's, it's good for us to be able to remember that this wisdom comes to us through a relationship with God, in a relationship with God through Jesus, because we fall short to fearing God perfectly, don't we? We, we don't fear God perfectly. But there's one man who did, God man who perfectly feared God, suffered and died for those who don't do this perfectly. He suffered and died for sinners who don't do this perfectly. You don't do this perfectly. You don't, you know, I don't, we don't do this perfectly. That's why Paul says, wisdom is wrapped up in Jesus. Jesus is the epitome of wisdom. Colossians chapter two. The wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding and a true knowledge of God's mystery, Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. It's all wrapped up in Jesus. Because, friends, Jesus was perfect. Jesus perfectly feared God when you failed. Jesus perfectly shunned evil. And that record is credited to you through faith alone. You will fail. You will not fear God. You will not shun evil. You will sin. But what do you do? You go back to God's grace. It's grace at the cross. Because Jesus was perfect in your stead. So when you fail, you can say, thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> when I failed, you were perfect. And that credit is, is credit to me. And my sin is put on Jesus. That's why you bless me and you show me grace and mercy. Help me to show grace and mercy for others. True wisdom is found in submitting to Jesus. You give up your life. And remember to the world, this is foolishness. 
And not even Job did this perfectly. This describes Job's life, really. Fearing God, shunning evil. You see that chapter 1 and chapter 2, right? Of Job. We looked at that. But not even Job did this perfectly. Job also needed a savior to save him from his sins. And yet Job was really, Job was a type of Christ. Job points us to Jesus. Because as Job suffered unjustly, he didn't deserve this suffering. He didn't do anything to merit this. But as he as he suffered without sin, and yet God was raised upon him in the same way Jesus, he would suffer, but Jesus was perfect. And he suffered for those who were unjust, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God. Jesus would also suffer. He would die in the place of sinners to bring sinners back to God. <laughs> Okay, so practically, what do we do with this? Practically. When you're talking about fearing God and shunning evil, this is the concept of putting off and putting on. Shunning evil is putting off. Fearing God is putting on. It's avoiding evil and actively obeying God's word. And I gave you some example passages. Looking down to the New Testament, and look at, I'll read those in a second. In Galatians and Ephesians and also in Proverbs 8.13, it says the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. I hate arrogant pride, evil conduct, perverse speech. We, we read that this morning. So the concept of, so how do you put into practice fearing God and, and avoid evil? Put off the old, you put on the new. Avoiding sin, avoiding evil. Fearing God, you put on the truth. So it's a constant thing. I'll read these to you. In Galatians 5.13 You are called to freedom, brethren, only don't turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Not the flesh, but through love serve. Those putting off, putting on. What's the motivation of the gospel? God has shown you love. God has served you in love. So what's the motivation? You put off that flesh and you put on Love, serving one another in love. Ephesians is even better than this. 4.22, in reference to your former manner of life, you may cite the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. Lay aside, be renewed in the spirit of your mind with scripture, and he says, put on the new person, which in God has been created in righteousness and the holiness of the truth. You're putting off, you put on. This is what it means to become a Christian. You put off, you repent and trust in Christ. That's what it means to become a Christian. And God changes you. That's what we're going to do with baptism. What's baptism? You go under the water. You die. You come up out of the water. You're a new person. That's what it depicts. That's why it doesn't make any sense for infants to be baptized. That's why we don't do sprinkling. Why? Because you die with Christ. And you are resurrected. You're a new person. And what happens? What happens when you die? You are buried. You die, right? You go to earth. But then at the resurrection, you will be a new person. A whole new person. Body and soul. Get it? See? So you put off. You put on. Lay aside the old stuff. You put on the new. This is how you work this out practically. This is this um, practically putting off evil, putting on. I've given you much to ponder when, if, when you go to gospel groups tomorrow night and Tuesday night, there will be much you can discuss. So let's take a few moments, though, and let's ponder these things we've seen here in the book of Job and God's Word and, and how we see God's wisdom. And then we'll do our time of giving, worshiping the Lord and giving, and we'll sing a couple songs together. <laughs>